Welcome to Arizona. A word that to many conjures the image of a lifeless desert scape, devoid of water and drenched in sun. Others may think of it as the remains of the Wild West, what's left standing from the towns that were hinted at by young guns and 310 to Yuma. If they're more informed, they may think about visiting one of the many state and national parks blanketing the landscape. Or maybe they're considering a vacation to the Valley of the Sun, currently the 10th largest metro in the country. Maybe they're here to witness the relics of Americana, the still standing symbols of the over 385 miles of Route 66 that stretched across the state towns that still wait for visitors to exit off the interstate, which bypassed them a long time ago. After a few days in Arizona, visitors might begin to discover the true splendor of the Copper State. might see signs of the people who called Arizona home before their home was called Arizona. And they'll see symbols of the first European state that colonized the area. As well as symbols of the country that declared independence against them. You'll see the signs of the U.S. citizens who pushed west after the Civil War, trying to make a different life for themselves in this free land of opportunity. You'll also see the blending of all of those cultures mixed in the copper melting pot. State 48 is a place to expect the unexpected. Unexpected weather and environments from desert to alpine tundra. They might notice one of the 20 plus indigenous nations that call Arizona home. Hopefully they'll stop at one of the countless taquerias or food trucks to get a feel of the traditional and modern Mexican culture of the state. Maybe they'll get to experience the modern, not so wild west. Or potentially get to see a retro renovation of those early 20th century motels, restaurants, and shops. This is what it looks like. There's one of them around a mile. That now greet guests in a new way. Maybe they'll see one of the murals depicting the history of a building. The history of the state. The history of the cultures. That may be one of the most unexpected things of Arizona. Is how much art can be found everywhere. On the sides of buildings, on interstate overpasses, next to train tracks and drainages, in the middle of nowhere. Maybe they'll be lucky enough to stumble into one of the many art galleries that are spread across the state. Housing pieces from thousands of local and transplant artists many of whom escaped to the desert southwest specifically to freely explore their artistic abilities. It might be safe to say that many people come to the 48th state just for that reason, to explore a sense of freedom that you can't find elsewhere. The big sky, the big landscapes, the miles of highways, 
and the tiny places to hide and just be yourself. But in all that time exploring this freedom, there's one thing that visitors to Arizona might not pay much mind to. And that's the one thing about the 48th state that isn't that free, or state of incarceration that many Arizonans exist in. And it's here, in Arizona correctional facilities, where you find the most unexpected thing. A treasure trove of creativity and innovation put on hold in the penitentiary system. When you're in prison, of course. Like, they, like they, there, there's so many restrictions in prison. We're limited to what we have. You know, we've lost, you know, potentially a good son, a good father. A scientist, an inventor. And they made the whole thing out of paper. And these are just some little examples of some of the things that they do with the roll that paper. No, it's art. <laughs> but I did a piece, I did a, a, a etching out of a piece of shoe rock. So if I walk to the, I did a Raiders Nation out of that. And I'm trying to make home for all of them. I've never seen people do etching on Shiva. A wonderful teacher. They teach each other how to do this. Honestly, if I would have never met you, I don't think that art would have ever been in my foresight. You know, it's our loss for having these people in prison. One of the best places to experience artistry from inside the penitentiary is at the Straight From The Heart Art Show, which has been given space here at the Coffee Exchange in Tucson, Arizona. So, um, I've got uh, one piece I uh, here. This is a summer size metal sculptor from Jerome. And, and um, now, of course, she can't sculpt with metal while she's in prison, so she's teaching herself how to do, she does mostly abstract pieces, and uh, I, I really love this when she says this. Meet Reverend Kim Kreka, deacon at the St. Matthew's Episcopalian Church of Tucson, convener for the prison ministry programs of the Episcopalian Diocese of Arizona, and the driving force behind the Straight from the Heart art show. So that's why I call it straight from the heart, because they are actually giving some, some input from the artists themselves. Through her work in the prison ministries, Reverend Kreka has gained a first-hand perspective of the relationship between art and incarcerated individuals. And while she was incarcerated, she did one uh, painting a day. She had over 15,000 paintings. She taught herself while she was in, yeah. She learned how to, to do the eyes. She said that was the trickiest part, was learning how to set the eyes so that they uh, had a realistic right off. Most of the artists that she works with are or were one of the over 4,000 inmates housed in the only Arizona prison complex set up for women. ASPC Perryville, which is located on the outskirts of Phoenix, Arizona. I met her um, through a mutual friend who had been released from uh, prison and had brought Mary Ann's art out with her when she was released. And I made arrangements with Mary Ann when she got out to get the art back to her so that she could have a means of earning a living. And she said, no, um, just send me a picture of all of it and use the money from the sale of the art to help fund the re-entry facility that we have for women who are being released in prison. So that's what we do. So all, all of their work has been donated to our diocese. So our diocese then puts it on display for a suggested donation to find prison ministries. But some of the artists have been released and I don't know how to get a hold of them. It was difficult to find previously incarcerated artists who are willing to speak about their experiences. However, one of the newest artists that Reverend Kim worked with, and one of the few male artists that she's had the pleasure of connecting with over the years, 
was being released later that week after serving a 12-year sentence, most of which was spent in ASPC Yuma, about 10 miles north of the U.S.-Mexico border. Recording devices were not allowed within the complex, both for safety issues and for department hesitation towards media, stemming from recent exposés highlighting security concerns at several facilities across the state. Although his release couldn't actually be recorded, his family did stop to say hello before they drove in to see him, presumably for the last time. And when they drove out, it would be the first time they got to drive out with him. <laughs> this is Julio Miramontes, a proud and loving father, son, uncle, and brother, an innovative artist, and now a free man. I'm definitely going to get out of here. I don't even want to look at this place. Oh, it's not so good. <laughs> On his way home, Julio decided to make a stop at the Yuma Art Center an art gallery about 20 minutes away from the ASPC facility which he was housed at. While still serving his sentence, Julio entered several pieces in their Sunniest Place on Earth exhibit. Ironically, the public was allowed to freely enjoy Julio's art before he was allowed to freely enjoy it himself. Video recording was not allowed at the time of filming. However, once inside, Julio and his family discovered that one of his pieces had won an honorable mention something like a fourth place amongst the winners. After seeing his accomplishments and growth over the past decade on full display, Julio and his family left the gallery proud and hungry. So the next stop was to find a well-deserved meal, far from the commissary goods and nearly inedible cafeteria food found in most penitentiaries. Uh, I don't know how you guys feel about it, but I mean, this is my, per my first uh, meal. Yeah, and so, I mean, I, I thank God from before my meals. That's all I needed. That's all I needed. That's, all I needed. That's pretty good. The garlic brick here at, uh, where is it? what is it called? The boys? The, uh, hey, you guys gotta pay me for that. Marvelous. Julio appreciated the time reuniting with his family, including some of his family who was out of state, like his father. <laughs> After a brief phone call, Julio even opened up about his past and shared his enthusiasm for his future with the waitress at the restaurant. Guys, it's cool for other people to be, to see that they they can do something different. There's something else once you get out. Yeah, yeah a life. I think that's really important. I have three pieces here in the Yuma Art Center right now. That's where we just came from right now. After lunch, Julio and his family decided to explore Yuma, the city which he had lived in for years, but due to his confinement, never got to experience himself. Yeah, uh, Sedona too. He finally got the opportunity to freely converse with his son. He even got to share some of the technology that he used when he was younger. So you go to you put your six all the way to the end, you let it go. Walking around Yuma's downtown, everything brought Julio joy and excitement. There were constant reminders that he was no longer an incarcerated individual. And as luck would have it, the art center, where his pieces were displayed, was holding their annual Art in the Park. Ironically, the festivities in the park were all in the shadow of the Yuma Territorial Prison, the first prison in the state of Arizona. As one of Arizona's many state parks, the prison now sits as a monument to the state's carceral past, open daily for the public as a tourist attraction. You can't explore Yuma without being reminded of the pivotal role the city played in policing the western frontier. What I heard that the governor or the director or somebody, when they closed this, this prison, that uh, 
that they took all the inmates and they made them walk. They made them walk from from here to Tucson. From what I understand, I'm, I don't know how sure that is, but that's. Further research did not support or deny Julio's claims. However, what is known is that in 1907, due to severe overcrowding, inmates of the Yuma Territorial Prison were forced to build a new facility located in Florence, Arizona. Completed nearly 115 years ago, the prison not only is still standing, but it still operates as one of the largest complexes in the state. Through its century plus of operation, it's housed many inmates in the state of Arizona, including Julio himself. It's important to note that even though many inmates were relocated to Florence, many others were not fortunate enough to leave the Yuma Territorial Prison alive. And just a short walk from the gates of the state park leads visitors to the prison cemetery, which is marked with rock gravestones and a lone memorial for the 104 souls laid to rest on Prison Hill. This memorial stands as a stark reminder that even though the release of individuals like Julio is well worth celebrating, many other individuals and artists will never again experience this type of freedom and sadly will be laid to rest in similar cemeteries across the state and nation. Something that Meredith Smith, with the organization Artists Serving Humanity, knows all too well. But what happened to him in the prisons often, they, they're they sent to, in, to clean a room and they mix, they had to mix chemicals that shouldn't be mixed and he got a lung a problem and he ended up dying while he was still incarcerated. I saw him on the hospice and he said he'd like to be known as an artist. Just like the rest of us, the artists represented in the Ash Gallery all have unique stories and experiences to share. One commonality between all the artists in the Ash Gallery is that no matter how different their life paths were, they all led to incarceration. This fellow, Mike Tran, and uh, had never been in trouble. He's Vietnamese. His mother came to live with he and his wife. Uh, and on her, on her dying words were, take care of your younger brother. The younger brother said, come on, uh, drop me off here. Wait just a minute. I'll be right back. The younger brother committed a crime in Santa Clara County, California. And then judge gave him both life without. The pandas, the turtle, the frog, the flamingo, Royal Clark did these. He was on death row since the age of 28 um, in California. And so this man now is on a regular yard. He's 60, I think. He's doing art. He said, I can open a window and I can see a tree. And he, and he may never get out of prison, but at least he's in a humane setting. And he said that actually his attorney is looking at the paperwork because he said he really should not have been given a life term. Now, Rodney Edinburgh had always said he was innocent. He was feeling down, kind of giving up, and I was worried about him. I was about ready to network to find out if he was okay, and I get a call in the evening, and he said he had a public defender, took the time to go through all the court paperwork. He'd been in prison 32 years. They released him that week, and he's out now. This one... Uh, Jacob Bunting did. He's actually an architect and he's out of prison doing great. And this guy, Diego Albanez, he, his family was in uh, El Salvador, then they went to Venezuela, some of them went to Spain. He came to the States with his mother. His father went to the Monterey Language School. He's an engineer in El Salvador. So whenever Diego would do art, I would email a picture of his art to his dad. So Diego is out now, and he's in a town near where my, my aunt lives. And so we were repairing a fence, building a new fence. So I called him, and we hired him $100 a day to help us do the fence. And he'd been out for a week. He was so that's thrilled. The Brewster there that is, was done by Miguel Magana, and he's out of prison, and he really would like to be known as an artist. So he's, he told me he's working 60 hours a week, doing everything he can to save his money so he can do art. 
excellent artist. He has relatives in Mexico City that are famous artists, but he came to the States and got in trouble. He actually was um, left home when he was about six or eight and lived on the streets in Mexico. So it's a tough life. After hearing about the unique set of circumstances each Ash artist experienced, it was hard not to think, but there for the grace of God go I, in that any one of us could potentially be incarcerated as well. In fact, straight from the heart artist Candace Wright had a childhood similar to most middle-class 1950s families. She was kind enough to share her story via Securus e-messaging, one of the easiest ways to communicate with incarcerated individuals in the state of Arizona. As she explained, she grew up in a typical post-war suburban home with a father who wore a suit and tie to work every day and a mother who was a homemaker. She grew up hunting, fishing, and horseback riding. She trained in art at the California Institute of Arts, and she even got a Bachelor's of Agricultural Biology from Cal Poly. Similarly to Candace, Deborah Monla had a relatively calm childhood, growing up in a small town in Southwest Michigan. Her and her family enjoyed road trips together in their station wagon, and in her early 20s, her own adventures led her to Southern California, some of the best years of her life. She gained new friends and new experiences along the way, and even met her first husband whom she had her son with. After her first marriage, she later met another man whom she married and traveled across the world with, as well as having her daughter. However, both Candace and Deborah's life paths led them the same place that every straight from the heart an Ash Gallery artist has led to. Bless his heart, look at this. He has been doing a lot of stuff like this which made sense. He was sent to a supermax in Colorado, and he said it was awful, and people were losing their mind there. And he said, finally one day, he, he just said a prayer and asked God for help. And he said, things changed. And he had a sentence of 25 to life. And he said once he realized he could not do it by himself and prayed, his whole life changed. And this is the little thing about him. Organizations like Artists Serving Humanity and straight from the heart, take great pains at humanizing individuals whose identities have been boiled down to the events that led to their incarceration. Labeling them um, by either their crime or by inmate uh, as their name, dehumanizing them by referring them as a number. Um, it's just a continual process of destroying that which makes them human and not at all conducive to releasing them. The dehumanization led to by incarceration is best summarized by a poem written by an Ash artist entitled Unsight after he was rejected from a parole board for lacking insight. Tell me the worst thing you've ever done, for that's all you are to me. Speak only of the mistakes you've made, that's all I need to see. Reveal to me your faults and flaws and the anguish you have cost. Failings to me are all you are, the rest of you is lost. I will not take you at your word or acknowledge who you've become. You are to me nothing more than the dreadful things you've done. The rest of us are each a sum, but of you such is not true. So tell me the worst thing you've ever done, and that's all I'll see in you. A lot of misconceptions exist around incarcerated individuals, the primary one being about mental health. Severe mental, uh, mental illness occurs among 70 to 78 percent of those who are in our prisons. Severe mental illness. The institutions that used to care for them have been closed down, so now our prisons are housing those who have treatable mental illnesses and treating them as criminals. The mental health of incarcerated individuals is especially important to ash artist Mike Tran. During filming, he reached out to contribute his perspective and message to the documentary. He decided to reach out via an art form that's nearly forgotten by most today. Although anybody with loved ones in a correctional facility 
will automatically recognize the sight of a handwritten letter. One of the easiest ways to communicate between the free world and the penitentiary. While incarcerated, he's been able to become a substance use disorder counselor, which has given him an intimate view into the emotional and mental state of many of his fellow inmates, many of whom were victims of crimes and abuse themselves while children. And they've gone through life trying to cope with the trauma brought on by those early past experiences. He emphasized the importance of informing the public of the mental health realities which he and his fellow inmates go through. He went through a horrible, horrible abuse, and then he also went through abuse in foster care. And the foster care parent, would, he and his brother were there, she would say, you guys fight whoever wins has dinner. The other one stays in the closet until it's bedtime. And he, uh, he said his childhood was a nightmare. He became an alcoholic by the age of 15. Even individuals who don't have to deal with severe mental illness or the same levels of trauma as other inmates still have to manage the day-to-day -day battle of maintaining their mental health. And like those outside of prison, they struggle with similar emotions. He said, the title is shame. He said, what well, we all feel but we never talk about. They also face the same situations around relationships co-parenting, and family. When I was there, my son's mom was going through kind of a tough, uh, a rough patch with the, the, the guy that she was with at the time. And she, he left her kind of in a financial burden a little bit. So me, I always, I've always told her that I'm always gonna make sure that you try, you're okay because if I know you're okay, I know my son's okay. So her going through rough times, it made me feel like, well, my son's gonna be affected by this. However, unlike those of us who are outside of prison, they have a limited set of resources to help address their mental health needs. And art becomes an invaluable therapeutic tool. You know, there's a lot of real predators in the prison. So if you're just kind of a regular person that's in a sea of sharks, you know, a way that you can escape is do your art. It's important for mental health. Um, yeah, because in prison, it's not always safe to be vulnerable with other people. Many inmates use art as a way of coping with their limitations. Some use it to deal with the financial limitations. I wanted to try to find something I can do from in there to try to help her out here. Because if you get a job in DOC, you're, you're getting 15, 20, 25, 35 cents, you know, 45 cents tops. You're making what, like 20 bucks every two weeks? It's, it, how, what are you gonna do with that? And if you're good at your art, you can always trade something for soups or, you know, so it becomes a commodity at some point too. So a lot of people try to find something to do and I was just lucky that I'll, I've, I've always been into art. It wasn't until I went to prison that I started taking it more seriously because I was inspired by other, other inmates that were doing. Other incarcerated individuals use art as a means of mentally escaping their physical confinement. Uh, Sheldon Alvarez that did the, the ARC, he said when Diego goes into his cell, he puts on his earphones and he's doing art. Other, and he's taken away from the prison. And other artists have said that too, that when they're doing art, their focus is on creativity and the yelling and the negativity and the walls and everything, the, the prison itself disappears. It's meditative, you know, and uh, it's creative and they, they find themselves away from the prison when they're doing art. Not only is it a benefit for the artists themselves, but it seems to impact other inmates as well. Laughing, dude. Because every minute I spent watching your hand or picking your brain helped me more than you can imagine. Not just physically, but mentally as well. I look up to you, bro, and you inspired me to be a better version of myself in the world of art and in society. <laughs> you taught me that no matter your circumstances, whether you're broken or rusted, that you can put the pieces together and polish your mind and your spirit and you can create something beautiful. Keep doing what you're doing and remember that if everything 
<clears throat> leading up to this moment couldn't stop you, then nothing else can. <laughs> Others use it as a cathartic expression of self. In tremendously healing for them. Um, and I have some who paint pictures of what they went through as a child as a way of getting that out of them. So now they can go on ahead and move on to the next thing. They use that as a form of, of uh, therapy um, and, and just expunge that from themselves. Once they've gotten it out and sent it to someone, I often hear from them says, oh, I feel so much better now. Uh, I haven't got that trapped inside. Someone else knows. And so I'm not alone anymore. So art has really been a, a means of allowing them to help self-heal, help um, provide some form of therapy for themselves that is more than just creative. And with the help of organizations like Straight From The Heart and ASH, they're able to reach a broader public unaware of the realities in which they live. As one of the artists told me, the, the paintings are that, like their children and they're sending them out and, and to find that they're accepted by the outside world uh, just means the world to them right there that's that's all they that's all they seek is just um, an acknowledgement that what they have created is beautiful in the eyes of a beholder when we have people coming through this straight from the heart uh, art show and they read what the women um, have written about the art and about their life in prison. They begin to see these people as human beings. They begin to see them as uh, as somebody that could be their neighbor um, instead of what we normally would think of as a criminal as depicted on TV or in the movies. Something innocuous like an art exhibit um, opens more doors for me and I'm able to get in and uh, talk to people about the artists and uh, about some of these issues and expose them to things that they would not normally be aware of because it's not in the news, let's just face it. Even though the realities of incarcerated individuals don't seem to get much media attention, at a recent exhibition at the St. Francis of the Valley Episcopal Church in Green Valley, Arizona, the artists whom Reverend Kim works with were at least able to reach the local news publication with the assistance of several individuals who wanted to help elevate their story, like one of their newest gain supporters, Helen Russo, a Green Valley local, who felt compelled enough to write a letter to the editor of the Green Valley News, as well as promote the show amongst her neighbors by sharing her own enthusiasm. So my mission has been, since I saw this, the display myself, I've been throughout my wanderings through Green Valley announcing this and having people come to it. A neighbor I spoke to last night around the corner from New York, she came and she said it was totally amazing and emotional. And in my article that I wrote, I said that this was not art you normally think it's just to see with your eyes. I called it a heart-to-heart -heart display because it touched you. Um, I was intrigued by the fact that it was coming from a prison because I think sometimes the incarcerated are forgotten part of humanity. And I was amazed with the description of each one because it told me that in that they saw strength, consolation, uh, more in touch with reality in the midst of isolation. Like I said, I think they're forgotten. And my mission in my whole life, including up to now, has been to try to make people feel the best that they can be in the eyes of the Creator, because He did not create junk. It means a lot to her, and it, and it uh, symbolizes the restraints that prison puts on freedom of speech, um, freedom, just any any freedom is, is totally unrestrained, and your voice is silenced. When shared outside of prison walls, their pieces become messages to the broader public. Many times they become commentary 
on the state of incarceration itself. This particular one, which depicts what it's like to live in an Arizona prison in the summer months, many people were unaware that the prisons were not all air conditioned. In his letter, Ash artist Mike Tran expressed the importance of using his art as a vehicle to champion for the rights of incarcerated individuals. Through his work with Artists Serving Humanity and another organization, the Justice Arts Coalition, he's been able to spread his message to the broader public, unaware of the reality that he and his fellow inmates experience within the California State Penitentiary they have been forced to live in. Mike Tran that did the, the Falcon, I guess, over there, he did this. A key part to his message is correcting misconceptions about incarcerated individuals caused by sensationalized media. One misconception around incarceration is that although women only make up about 10% of the U.S. prison population, there's nearly 100,000 incarcerated women across the U.S., all of whom face a unique set of challenges which their male counterparts don't have to contend with. Yeah, the, the Perryville prison is the only women's prison in the state of Arizona. So any woman who's incarcerated is sent there. And many people are surprised to learn that the majority of the officers um, who work there are male. There are, there are not many women who can actually stomach being an officer uh, because it's a very, very difficult and demanding job, not physically, but emotionally and mentally. I, I've actually spoken with former um, officers within uh, the prison system, especially a, a female officer, and she just said, I just couldn't take it anymore just to, to see how degrading it was. Um, and the treatment of the inmates was so degrading that it just made me feel dirty and it made me feel ashamed when I came home and I had to get out of there. Straight from the heart artist Candace Wright also expressed her feeling that prisons are built for men by men with the needs of the female population considered dead last. Be it the ease of access to feminine hygiene products or the limited rehabilitation programs that seem to be more geared towards men. Incarcerated women's needs and rights need to be spoken for. And Ms. Wright Erickson has dedicated her time in prison to speaking up for those rights. And just like Mike Tran, she uses her artistic ability to do so. Yeah, so the, um, and the artist that, that does this one, she's very much an advocate for change within the prison system. Through her cartoons, she's spoken about issues such as a fellow inmate's complications with breast cancer, and the prison's slow response to getting her life-saving medical attention. Commentary on herself and fellow elderly inmates, as well as general issues that inmates face being incarcerated in the hot Arizona desert. She even runs an informative blog with the help of a friend on the outside, detailing the hardships that her and other Perryville inmates experience daily. She has a blog um, that's run by a friend of hers and she provides information about what's actually going on within the prison. She, she provides an eye on the inside. Along with the unique set of issues and needs that incarcerated women face, they also seem to have a unique art form that tends to be only found in women's facilities. The paper craft art form of quilling which is the creation of forms by using strips of paper rolled in on themselves. And one of the things that, that they do is they uh, use scraps of paper that they can paint with um, watercolors or they can color painstakingly with colored pencils and then they'll do what's called quilling and, and make um, designs that are pleasing. And I don't know how it is with the men, but women by nature are creators. And so I, I, I can see where that's coming from with them. But they have to create. They have to find a way, and they do. They find a way to bring joy and beauty into their lives. Recently, there have been programs put in place in facilities for both men and women, which allow them to explore their artistry.
with the help of the ASU Center for Correctional Solutions, headed by Dr. Kevin Wright, was the, way to reduce the incarcerated program, which is a collaboration with the Arizona Department of Corrections, has been operating since 2017, aside from a few hiatus years brought on by the coronavirus. Um, before the pandemic hit, the um, ASU had a team of people coming in and offering these art instruction classes, which were hugely popular on almost all of the yards. Instructors from ASU would come in and they would teach inmates who would then teach other inmates. So they would have their classes and then the inmates would then conduct classes with other inmates during the week. And then they would come back and meet with ASU and, and learn a new technique and then teach that new technique. So it was a way of expanding across um, the prisons. I was skeptical at first like that. In the research, this would be stuff that maybe it doesn't reduce recidivism or don't divert resources to it. So I was like, all right, you, you all want to do this, we'll do it. And it's been incredible. I, I'm a believer now. Like I'm full on art now. I don't have an artistic bone in my body, but to see the, the change on the inside and the, the contributions that have been made, it's been a really, really good experience. Through the incarcerated program, the Center for Correctional Solutions puts on a yearly art show which allows the public to view and purchase artwork from incarcerated individuals. As explained in their board overview, this allows inmates to serve their time productively while embracing their creativity and talent. It's also an opportunity for them to share with the public. So for me, the vulture represents rebirth after, you know, putting aside some stuff and, 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 and coming out different. As well as give back, which to date, with the help of incarcerated artists, the Center for Correctional Solutions has raised around $38,000 for local charities. Proceeds from these paintings go to a scholarship so they can, they can, for the formerly incarcerated and their families. I think it's just fabulous. The desire to give back was echoed by Julio, who donated several pieces while he was still incarcerated. This one went to the Humane Society, this one sold for $1,000 at all. And even upon release, Formerly incarcerated artists still desire to give back. But the items of art of hers that I have on hand, she has generously um, told me that anything um, that we receive by way of donation for her art is to go to help support the reentry facility that we have for women that's based in the Phoenix area. Art programs for incarcerated individuals not only benefit the inmates, but also the broader public. And with a new administration in the governor's office, a new director has been put in charge of ADCRR, who seems to understand the importance of art, its impacts on incarcerated individuals, and its benefits for the public. Yeah, we know that education causes internal change. Anybody who really devotes themselves to learning, uh, we know is going to be better off in the long run. Requests for an official comment from the ADCRR went unanswered. However, they do have an official agency YouTube page. There you'll find highlights of their staff, inmates, and successful programs that they've been operating. And although attempts to get an official comment from the department were unsuccessful, while attempting to get Julio as a participant in the documentary, the mostly female staff who communicated on his behalf were extremely friendly and helpful in facilitating communication between him and the project. In addition, they were all extremely supportive of Julio and his efforts to pursue his artistry. Just conversations that I've had with them, I feel like I made better friends with some of the staff than, than most of the inmates. And we, I've never had any of them say that, oh, we're friends. Like, no, I, I understand that it's inappropriate. But I think it's kind of like an unspoken word, like an unspoken thing. Like, just the, the interactions that I had with some of these people, some of these staff, it, it just, it really made me feel like, like, while I was there, I was a friend to them. The artists who shared their experiences all expressed varying levels of support they felt from Department of Correction staff. However, in Julio's case, the support that he received from members of the ASPC Yuma staff was pivotal in his ability to pursue his artistry. It's basically like they have to have this because it's, it's a way for the administration to know what it is that we're doing, you know? Very lucky that the deputy warden at the time, 
she allowed me to go to the visitation area to, to just do whatever kind of murals I wanted to, as long as they were appropriate for families for visitation. My supervisor there from visitation, the visitation officer, I, I felt that she kind of was one of those that didn't look at us in, in a good light, you know? And it was that same officer I bumped into later on when I re reclassed and scaled down to a lower level yard. That's the person that helped me the most out of everybody. She was trying to help me get, like, be, uh, stay active with the art art things and other uh, other CO3s would ask her, like, hey, can you do something for me? Once I did the first piece for her and she gifted that piece to uh, one of the deputy wardens, when I didn't understand what she was doing too, she was gifting to him so, so he would allow me to continue to do more. After that, like a bunch of things started happening to me that Deputy Warden allowed her to continue to uh, help me doing, doing these projects and other people started asking her for a bunch of, uh, of my art because... An unintended benefit of incarcerated individuals pursuing their artistic abilities seems to be, at times, to improve relations between staff and the inmates they have to police. When, when the deputy warden told me that what I've done is not only inspired other inmates to pursue something like this to keep out of trouble, but I have also not inspired but helped change certain officers' perspective of the inmates in general, you know, like. I've helped change some of her officers' perspective because of they seen how I consistently stayed with it, and I never, I never veered. I never veered from from what I was trying to do, and from me being persistent and consistent, I I, I like to believe that that's kind of what softened them up. Because some of the toughest guys there, like some of the strictest guys there. My last days in prison were wishing me well. The relationships artistry builds between prison staff and inmates is mutually beneficial. Inmates who focus their energy on more constructive uses of their time seem to be less involved in the institutionalized prison yard politics. Like, I intentionally, intentionally made it a point to not think about the day to day, not not allow myself to in a sense be institutionalized you know because a lot of people do when they when they focus on the oh what time we are for child well you know like what time when we're gonna store when we're doing this like you know what i mean like uh, it just it's mine and it's just con constant 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 on a daily repetitive 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 and i honestly think that's how people get institutionalized i was never trying to Think, even think about memorizing, you know, what order we are for this or what we're having for nothing like that. You know, this, yeah, with, with this art, man, like it's, it wasn't going to brain drain me, you know, like that. Staff who understand the benefits of inmates pursuing these constructive endeavors are more likely to provide materials that otherwise wouldn't be available. It was hard. It was very hard to get get people to agree to allow you to use these materials, these bed sheet materials, this even try to get wood for it. Like the wood would never enter the yard. The wood would never be in like our living areas or nothing like that. It was hard to try to get all that stuff, but persistence, 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 persistence. This is not readily available to us in prison due to the restrictions imposed on us Pursuing artistic ability even affords some inmates responsibilities, job duties, and privileges that some of their fellow inmates don't have. Um, this is her in front of a mural that she painted inside the prison. And she wrote to me and she said they still let her have acrylic paints because she does these murals. Being trusted enough for these privileges can be vital for incarcerated artists. Because just like their fellow inmates, they all deal with the scarcity of items easily found outside of the penitentiary. However, just like their fellow inmates, that scarcity drives innovation, and those who truly desire to create 
we'll find a way. Uh, we have a quote from Picasso on our letterhead. Basically it says, even in a prison cell, I would draw with the wet of my tongue. You know, if, you know that, that this is what keeps me alive, is really being able to draw and create and make something beautiful, you know. Um, it pushes people to either give up and just leave it alone or find an alternative. You know, some people still had watercolor paints, so they'll break those down and shave them, like crush them up and mix it with water or mix it with that floor wax and use it as paint. You know, because that floor wax, when it mixes with the with that powder, it would kind of apply well on, on, on paper or whatever it is that they're using. So people get creative, people get real creative. Incarcerated artists combine and create materials that would nearly be unheard of to their contemporaries outside of prison walls. You know, even this piece right here, this is majority coffee. It's, it's pretty blurry. Uh, I don't have the actual, you know, picture, but this whole tr tree, she's she's all coffee. Those tones right there, that's all coffee, but it's lighter tones. And then I just added way more down here, and I mixed it with uh, every unit. Pretty much has a um, there's called they call it a sweat lodge for the Native Americans, and they burn wood there. So sometimes the pieces of of uh, charcoal would fly out of the sweat lodge. And I would use those those charcoal pieces and I'll mix it with this coffee to make it darker. You know, the pieces of charcoal. This one is called Serenity. And, that, and that's the thing is that they'll, they'll use anything, anything they can get their hands on. I don't know if you can see this, but this banner is made entirely out of rolls of paper. And you can see in the end um, that they're just rolls and rolls of paper that she is painstakingly painted with, um, with, with watercolors and then uh, laid out to form uh, these designs. And then they use toothpaste to glue them together because they're not allowed to have glue, of course. And the way that they cut these tiny little strips is with a push pin. This is dental floss that runs through each one of these. And so little tiny strips of dental floss that they get on those little pre-done toothpicks they will pull out and tie together <laughs> this is this is a cording that she made by uh, pulling apart a cording that comes on uh, sanitary hygiene women's hygiene products and the creative use of unconventional materials out of necessity provides a unique look to artwork is not readily seen in galleries across the art world. Oh, look at this one, this one. I don't got it in color, but this is a piece of sheetrock. That's an etching. I believe it's a 28 by 32, if I remember correctly, 28 inches by 32 inches or 36 inches, just about. Uh, he did it with a big pen. And he used a Kool-Aid for the lip coloring. Okay, so Curtis Morrison, 81, he used to make them out of uh, leather when he was at Folsom, but they took away the leather because uh, the tools could be used as weapons. So then he would make them out of found materials, and that's that. Pretty amazing, huh? These unique art pieces even draw an interest from the public, who come specifically to see designs that are born from a scarcity of supplies. And when I read initially in the paper the difficulty that they had in getting the materials, I definitely wanted to see it. When I did see it, I was just very impressed with the quality of the painting. For incarcerated artists, even scrap paper or old pieces of cloth become the foundation for beautifully unique pieces of art. It is, I'm not sure if it's wood or if it's uh, wound up paper. I think it's paper, because I think, yes, yeah, paper. And there's a light in the captain's cabin, battery run light. This is pretty cool. Mr. Dubois did this clock. He had a life term. 
But I gotta stay there so long. Mr. Arroyo did this one on cloth, but it's all of the Mexican revolutionaries, including the women, which I think is especially nice. The use of cloth by Mexican and Chicano artists has a long history in prisons from Texas and across the Southwest to California. Paños, as the medium is referred to, have been being created for nearly a century. They're generally filled with culturally important symbols of Mexican heritage and are commonly sent to relatives and friends as gifts or greeting cards. Individuals that aren't that artistically inclined make a mission of paño from a fellow inmate, such as Julio. You know, like people will say, hey, do a paño for me, do a paño for me, you know, like, it kind of sounds like super, super like cholo. A paño is basically something that like, people would cut up a piece of bed sheet, draw on it, and they call it a paño, you know, like. While incarcerated, Julio specialized in giant paños that were the size of full or nearly full bed sheets. That's what this basically is, a paño. It's one, one of these pieces is on a bed sheet. It was actually the very first one that I did. The deputy warden at the time, he didn't know what, what I was talking about, but because of the case manager that was helping me, she, uh, she pushed basically to kind of um, give, give us the opportunity or at least give me the opportunity and eventually, you know, it'll grow, it'll grow to something else. Um, she wasn't allowed to use like DOC uh, materials, but she was allowed to bring sheet material in. Um, I cut it up the size that I needed it. I, I built a frame. I built the frame myself. I stretched it around a, a canvas. We didn't have a nice fancy industrial stapler, so we just <laughs> used a regular stapler. <laughs> and um, I painted it. and wherever it is, I don't remember. I don't know where it's at. I need to organize this stuff a little bit better. This one's on bed sheet also. She, and that's why that's why he took it from me. This guy uh, took it from me because it was on a bed sheet. And he didn't take it from me because it was on a bed sheet. He wanted to keep it and I proved, I knew he wanted to keep it and he, he still has it. Not only do incarcerated artists have to deal with confiscations based on supposed misuse of property by themselves, but they also have to deal with statewide retaliation based on the actual misuse of state property by other inmates. They, like, they, they, there's so many restrictions in prison. We're limited to what we have, and then some dummies do certain things with certain materials, and it causes a statewide ban of all acrylic paints. It was late in 2020 that there was an escape attempt at the Florence Men's Facility by two individuals who worked with the physical plant. They were captured within a week, um, a very short time, period of time. But in the meantime, um, in retaliation for this escape attempt, and this often happens anytime there is an escape attempt, there is retaliation across the entire prison system in Arizona. It's not just against uh, the prison where that escape uh, attempt occurred or against the individuals who attempted the escape. It's prison-wide. So in retaliation for this particular um, escape attempt, what happened was all acrylic paints in the prison were declared contraband. And so they were confiscated. Um, the inmates were given an opportunity to donate their acrylic paint supplies to schools and ostensibly uh, ADC then delivered these supplies to schools, although we don't know if that actually happened, or they could simply throw them away. So they mostly donated their supplies, but they no longer had access to any acrylic paints. They were no longer able to purchase canvases to paint on because those were no longer being carried in the commissary. The only thing that they had available to them to use then was um, cheap watercolor paint sets that you can buy for like a dollar. So they're getting really creative. And the artist that painted the buffalo over here, she mixed talcum powder with 
watercolor paint to try and get a texture similar to acrylic. Being an extremely talented artist, she was very disappointed, and I thought it was beautiful, but she was very disappointed in the outcome and the amount of time that it took her to achieve that just wasn't worth it. Wasn't worth the effort. She said she'll never do that again. So she's going to be released in 2025. Hallelujah. But this is the last painting that I will have from her. She's not going to do any more until she's released because she's fed up with trying to deal with um, the lack of supplies and the many challenges. More of the art that I'm receiving from uh, inside prison are um, pencil sketches like this one that's behind me here, made with those. Um, those little golf pencils. Um, they are all given that little short pencil that has a little stub of a, of a lead and no eraser. And that's what they get. So they, that's, that's what they have now to create their art. And they've gotten really creative with that. I had one artist who mixed her pencil with mascara to get like a charcoal effect. And sometimes restrictions and confiscations don't even come from the department itself. But individual COs who seem to have grudges against individual artists. Sure. He had complained because they would not let him bring his artwork into his cell to do. So if he was in therapy, he could do it there, but he couldn't bring it back into his cell. So he wrote something called a 602, which is a formal complaint. He did that. The lieutenant came and took all of his art materials away. Sorry, you, you have nothing. So he sent me this picture because he wanted to participate and he did it with a golf pencil, a little tiny three inch golf pencil. And sometimes restrictions and contention even come from other incarcerated individuals themselves. A lot of, a lot of people in, in prison are like that and they don't want nothing to do with uh, staff or officers. They might have an ability, a good ability to do something but they won't do it for them because they don't want to be seen as uh, whatever, you know, like being buddy buddies with the CEOs. I caught a lot of risk from that though, from, from, from my people, what they say my people. I caught a lot, a lot of animosity from them because they're accusing me of like safeguarding, like saving things for the, for the cops, you know, like where they're supposedly to break everything, burn everything, and I'm safeguarding things. So March 1st of 2018, I believe, it was, there was a lot of rumors going around about there was gonna be a mass riot because they're forcing us, a lot of inmate population were, felt like they're forcing us to sign what, what they call the inmate housing program, which meant that they were gonna start housing uh, whites with blacks, Mexicans with blacks, uh, you know, Mexicans with whites, natives, mixed basically, integrate in every, all the races. Arizona is a very segregated state. So there's a lot of tension happening. And the day of, it had nothing to do with it. It had nothing to do with it, but there's some drunk guys, some guys that were drunk and they, uh, they were being escorted to detention to kind of, I guess, the, so, detox or whatever. One thing led to another and it just became a huge, a huge riot. Um, basically, inmates, all inmates against staff. Well, during this big old riot, you know, there's fires outside of every single building. They're burning basically anything they could, breaking every single window that they could. Um, and you know, you kind of had to play the part, you know, like run around and acting like you're doing something because if you, if there people are perceiving you like not being part of the, you know, the movement or whatever the fuck they wanted to call it, you know, like you, it could have repercussions on you. So I was walking into my building. I remember I was walking into my building when this guy was walking out at the same time with my painting, a painting that I did for CO3 Ezra the main lady that was helping me with all the, the artwork stuff. It was in her office. They broke in there, they did a bunch of mess, and these, this guy was walking outside of the building with their hands like, hey, where, where are you going with that? You know, like, what are you doing? Oh, we're gonna burn it. I said, what the fuck you are, man? I, I got, I got mad. I was instantly like, enraged on it. This is my shit, you know, like, this is 
mother effort and this and that because in my mind I was if I would have got here 10 seconds later that piece would have been in the fire I took it to my my housing area and I basically to kind of keep it safe you know like it's you know, I was way in the back so I put it there and I just to keep it safe well little did I know that once they had us all outside TSU came through and they they you know lay everybody down and once they come in yeah you you, you lay down you know like you, all that tough tough guy stuff goes out the window <laughs> these are the biggest dudes the baddest dudes of, that they have and they equip them with enough gear to like do some damage you know so you don't want to get hit with a 12 gauge shotgun or the, the pellets or whatever they, the bean bags that they hit and they hit you with you know so yeah um so I didn't know that what they were doing, they were going around and searching every single person's area. And if they found something linking you to the right, something that belonged to any officer, anything that in your area that they can link you to the right, you're done. You're done. You're, you're, you're getting booked and you're out of there quick. So it's a pretty hard to hide up four foot by five foot painting you know like it's it's not easy and it was right in the middle of my my best face so i guess they're out there looking looking for me or whatnot and from my understanding they're calling her like letting her know hey well we found your painting over here in in this area and but they i i i think that she basically told him like, well, that's that's his pain, that's what pain it is, you know, like he's probably like safeguarding it or something. So people had an issue with that. And when something like that happens, they try to push, like they try to put pressure on certain people and they try to like, you know, get it to where, okay, you know what, well, we're gonna smash this dude out or we're gonna like beat him up and send him on his way or whatnot. Unfortunate for them, I was no pushover, you know, like, <laughs> I, I was no pushover and I know how to basically defend myself, not basically, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm the biggest, baddest dude, but I know what's right is wrong is wrong, what's right is right and what's wrong is wrong, you know, I'm not going to let this guy burn this piece because that's just like spitting in my face, like, you know, slapping, slapping me or something, you know what I mean, it's not, it's not going to happen. Why would I let you do something like even though it belongs to an officer, that's still my art. You know, like that's the No, 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 it's not gonna happen. And luckily, you know, it, all of that went away and it got kind of pushed under the rug and nothing happened of it, you know. Clearly, incarcerated artists see their work as more than just paintings or drawings. They're an extension of self an expression of the soul and spirit that exists underneath the orange jumpsuit. Just because we're all wearing orange doesn't mean that we all, our knuckleheads are all like dummies, you know? Like there's a lot of good people in prison. Yeah, we all made our mistakes. We have to pay for them. We have to pay for them. But it doesn't define us. It, it, it does not define who we are or the decisions that we make, the choices that we make, that's what defines us. Now, those are the things that really make you as a person, I, I believe. And regardless of who ends up with their art, whether it's family, prison staff, or art galleries ran by supportive organizations on the outside, their art is a vital part of their life. While they are caged behind fences, bars, and great steel gates, because these art programs gave the women an outlet. It gave them a, a way to, um, to feel useful, um, to, to feel uh, more like they were contributing, um, it, and indeed contributed to their rehabilitation. Along with the positive impacts that art brings to incarcerated individuals' mental health, financial stability, improved relationships with prison staff, Privileges and trust not extended to other incarcerated individuals, and the ability to stay connected to those on the outside. 
The pursuit of art can also provide skills and abilities that allow formerly incarcerated individuals to make a living for themselves once they are released. It was helping them to be um, better returning citizens as well. Some of them have enough skill to support themselves as artists when they come out. You know, teaching someone else how to create art is a skill. That's a skill that they could use elsewhere. It really helps restore them, restore their humanity and their belief in themselves. You gotta apply the yellow before you and then the black comes after to clean up that, that whole area. Yeah, because the black first is hard to get Yeah, but you can't get that little This is this is what I do. This is my this is my uh this is my plan and this is my life that I, I I'm focusing on my life in into my art. It's a very important for me. This is something I take very seriously. The certified art is what I'm focusing on now. I was released in mid January and I'm on the on the on the way. On the way there I see lots of doors opening up for me. I've been blessed to have many people uh, interested in what it is that I do. I'm grateful for every opportunity that, uh, that I'm given thus far. I've met lots of great people and I see great things going forward. There's no, there's no excuse for the wrong I've committed. There's no saying I'm sorry for a lot of the mistakes that I've made. There is, however, uh, opportunity to learn from my mistakes and the reality of our carceral state is that many who have been sentenced to serve any amount of time in state and federal penitentiaries will eventually be released back to a life with the rest of their fellow citizens because 90 percent of them are going to be released at some point uh, we're down here we're down here on uh on roosevelt by garfield there's a bunch of murals and all kinds of things over here. Like I, I, it was never like this in my life. Uh, well, remember, well, I used to stay in this area uh, down in, like, by downtown on 7th Street in Fillmore. But now it's like a whole bunch of shops, a whole bunch of little stores, and it's, it's crazy, dude. Yeah, it's nice. It's, it's, it's very, very much more like back then we, when. Now we used to live over here, it's kind of, kind of, this is actually pretty, pretty nice now. As their fellow citizens, who will soon become their neighbors, it seems to behoove us okay. to not only support, but foster constructive endeavors while individuals are incarcerated. Avoiding the arrested development that generally accompanies institutionalization not only benefits incarcerated individuals, but the rest of us in society. Being released with a different mindset than one had when they were incarcerated in the first place would seem to have a positive impact on the potential of an individual reoffending. He also has said, I want to be known as an artist, not a prison artist, but an artist. And although there doesn't seem to be any statistical proof on whether or not art impacts recidivism, it seems safe to assume that allowing incarcerated individuals to pursue art and other constructive uses of time could help reduce the potential of re-entry and in the end, create a healthier and safer community for all of us. In, in our church, we're taught to respect the dignity of every human being. So there's no exception. Um, every human being means every human being. By, by exposing people, especially those who are in churches who host a uh, large number of these art shows, um, it's, it's a way of helping them recognize, oh yeah, that's what that meant. I promised in my baptismal covenant to respect the dignity of every human being. Thank you for, to everybody at the Yuma Complex for everything that they helped me with and I wouldn't be where I'm at today if it weren't for all of you. Nosotros somos los Tigres del Norte. Cuando era niño, mi madre me decía, hijo, no juegues con las armas, que me dio su bendición. Ya lo puedo escuchar, los 
sé desde cuándo he visto el sol brillar porque sigo atrapado viendo la vida pasar en la prisión avanzan los años y el tren sigue su marcha San Antonio See, my, my brother and I, my brother and I, we used to constantly, we, we didn't have much money growing up, you know, so we try to entertain ourselves any way, shape, or form. And our, a big thing for us was we used to like getting into elevators and try to shoot to the highest floor, you know, and, and go to the top floor, like get as far as we could before we got busted and got kicked out. You know? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Right Well, I mean, you gotta give back to the community. So, I mean, this is definitely in some way you want to try to do it during the holiday season. More giving during that time of the year, and it seems to work. You know, a little more important time. It's nice. It's been tough during the pandemic, but things are starting to pick up. Yeah. Yeah, but yeah, it's been going good. And then I got my doctorate in clinical psychology, uh, started contracting with the prison, and loved it and continued with that as a clinical psychologist. And now you've started artists. Oh, well, I, the artist started artists serving humanity, and I just was a vehicle. And Reverend Kim said that you, you need to look her up, and then and, and oh, yeah. I can get you. Um, I can definitely give you her, her contact information. If you think my stuff is good, there's people that make my stuff look like cartoons, you know, like it, 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 it's, it motivates me though, you know, like I don't, I'm, I'm not the type of person that like, oh, I can do better than that. No, I, I applaud people that can take you know, Kool-Aid and turn it into an art piece, dude. That's just, it's just, a, it's amazing. It's, it's pretty cool.